Welcome everybody. Um, um, my, we are starting our uh, uh, second segment of um, our showcase, mentorship showcase for this year. My name is Shua Khan. Um, I'm a Kernel Maintainer and Linux Fellow at the Linux Foundation. I lead mentorships and I uh, also do Kernel Maintenance and so on. Okay, let's, uh, uh, today we have several uh, graduates uh, that are going to be coming in after me sharing their experiences with the mentorship program and what they have learned. And let's start a little bit uh, with uh, talking about the beginner's problem. Um, where, do I, where do we start is always a, uh, always something that we all struggle with when we are embarking on a new journey, new career path we might be looking at or um, which project, open source project we want to start contributing to. So the first thing we have to figure out is what, what are we passionate about and what do we enjoy doing? And also um, there are so many projects, open source projects out there in different technologies. It is difficult to figure out which one to get started in, contrib start contributing in, and which one to learn from. Okay, so then when uh, we finally figure that out, we have um, how do we get started problem. And then we'll, the core basis always look very complex and community looks intimidating and daunting. And what's the best place to start? So, um, and then we once we kind of figure out which, everything together, the first two pieces, then we look at where do we find resources? And then after that comes, who can help us with uh, our questions and who do we reach out to? So the what, the how, and the where, and the who. So those are all the things we struggle with. So at the Linux Foundation, we understand that um, all of these are complex problems for new developers. So we are providing resources and learning paths. So you can explore uh, your learning paths at the Linux Foundation training site. And here is the link that you can go and explore different paths. And then we also have um, uh, webinars, um, LF Live webinars that we have recorded, um, archived on, uh, on our webinar site. You can go take a look at that. You can learn various topics anywhere from uh, software engineering to community, open source, and uh, all other aspects, all the aspects that are, um, are important to learn in the open source ecosystem. And then once you uh, are comfortable and you want to uh, learn from experts from uh, and getting involved in an LFX mentorship program, you can apply for one and start working like our graduates have done in the last year, um, explore, ex learning from um, men experts. And then here we are today, um, the graduates are sharing their experiences at the showcase. And this is our attempt to connect our graduates with the uh, people looking for talent. All right, so um, the reason, as I mentioned earlier, we understand uh, access to resources is a barrier for a lot of people. and we design our programs with that in mind. And we empower people with our part-time mentorships and webinars and training resources and enabling women and people of, uh, people with work-life balance problems. So it's, it's a lot. We are trying to remove some of the barriers um, that um, people experience when they are trying to embark on journeys. So this is a packed uh, slides with a lot of information in here. And then please check that out. Um, we also went and surveyed um, our uh, graduates from 2019 through 2021 to understand how we can improve our resources, learning resources, as well as our mentorship programs. Um, this report is just out. It was released yesterday. Take a look at that. Here is a link um, for you to go download and read. And it will also give us our more insight into uh, where our heads are at and what our approach to uh, solving some of these problems, ac equity, access to information, and so on. And please take a look. 
Um, and with that, I will um, we'll get started. Hand it off to Sid uh, to get started with his uh, um, presentation. Hello, everyone. Just a minute. Uh, just wait, Sid. Let me stop sharing here. Oh, um, okay. I'm okay. Cool. Go ahead. So, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about how does one go from being an absolute node with respect to the Linux kernel towards sending multiple patches in multiple subsystems. So, this will be my journey from being an absolutely clueless to confident with the Linux kernel. I am Sidraman Pant and I welcome you all to my talk. So, a brief introduction about me. So, I am 21 and I am an electronics undergraduate. I am in my final year and I like interesting things and like especially low level stuff and Linux is one of them and hence I am here. So, back to the main crux. How does one go from being absolute no towards sending multiple patches? There are many ways. One can see tutorials, online courses, there are college stuff, or just read a book and things around. But one way is LKMP. LKMP stands for Linux Kernel Mentorship Program. And quoting from the program page, experienced Linux kernel developers and mentors, mentor volunteer mentees. So this is a very good opportunity because you cannot ask for better. Because you have a experienced person mentoring you. So one might be thinking, what do people really do in this? I can say what I did. I participated in Linux kernel bug fixing summer 2022. So in that, we had to fix bugs in the Linux kernel, which are usually uh, reported by tools like SysGeller and so on. So you do that, I had to improve my debugging skills. I understood very much about the kernel core stuff. And during Linux kernel mentorship program, Six bug fixes what merged during the program itself, the duration of program itself. And I sent bug fixes in various subsystems like Wi Fi, Loop, x86, and so on. And some of my patches went to the stable kernel also. And I recently set, sent a patch set of 10, which is a sizable, first sizable patch set of mine to the DRM tree. So I was literally clueless at the start. Over time, I became confident with my tinkering ability with the kernel. And since this was a bug fixing project, I uh, I sharpened my debugging skills and saw how does kernel work from, and it connects from one subsystem to another. If you search for me on the mailing list, you can find I keep on continuing and I respond to feedback and get involved in multiple patches. So I am inside your machine. Because if you run at the latest kernel, my contributions are there and are running in your machine. So this is an awesome thing to think about. So in this diagram, you can see on one side there is an absolute noob, and other side there is someone who is not an absolute noob but knows his way around. So what's behind this arrow? I have bifurcated it into two: uh, brain stalls and surprises. Brain stalls is a play on kernel stall. So, okay. So, first part is understanding challenges. So, one needs to know about what they are doing and why they are doing. Because otherwise, there is no point in doing. So, I had to learn about kernel, how the kernel works, why am I doing bug fixing. Bug fixing is important. So, let me tell you briefly about that. So, the kernel is huge. When I was starting out, I was surprised and also somewhat overwhelmed seeing the huge code base. First time the download took a sizable amount of time, a git repository load. So there is uh, there are millions of lines of code, thousands of contributors, and millions of commits. But since these are code statistics, we must say that the kernel code is huge. Kernel itself is very modular. So because we can use various config options and compile appropriately. But bugs are bound to seeping because this is a huge code base and kernel developers are humans after all. So one oversight here, one oversight there, and coupled with millions of lines of codes, we soon enough we are talking of a sizable deal. So there are many ways to detect. Uh, there are broadly two ways, static analysis and dynamic analysis. So in static analysis, there are various tools like GCC, Clank, Coxinal, which scans the code base 
the entire code base for bug, which affect all executions of the kernel. For instance, here in this photo itself, line 870 is a, apparently a null check, but this is an incorrect way to go for the check. So this was really found during compiling with a particular config setting using GCC. Fortunately, this bug was very not very critical, but it was in hiding for 13 years. So this shows how static analysis is important. But this was a correct, this was true positive, but static analysis might not always be correct. And also it won't catch all bugs because if they are dynamic in nature, so go for dynamic analysis, when bugs are detected at runtime. And there are many tools like case and self-test, syscaler, which is a fuzzing tool and more. So I mainly worked on syscaler reports. Uh, there is a dashboard, you may see of it, and we were at the liberty to choose whichever bug we wanted to work on. So the other thing is patching the bugs correctly. Okay, I understood what I had to do, but the doing part is also hard. Uh, once I started debugging the bugs, so it was very apparent that not always it's always localized to one thing. Uh, bug may be at one place, but the uh, detection might be at other place. So one had to do careful debugging. And there will be mess ups and setbacks. I really, at, at sometimes I really messed up hard. And I took really took a break thinking I could not do it. Sometimes I told my friends that I took something I couldn't do. But in the end, I could do it. Yeah. Uh, there are surprises, pleasant surprises, I would say. So mentors are one of them. This was impossible without my mentors, Shua Khan and Pavel Skripkin. They are experienced, very experienced Linux kernel developers, and they are volunteer mentees. So they took out their precious time to mentor us. And the interactions are extremely helpful. We had bi-weekly meetings on Zoom and we could interact otherwise outside Zoom and all. And they gave insightful answers to all our doubts, be it technical, be it navigating the community and mailing list. They were kind enough to review patches when we were starting out and they were overall guidance and sharing our knowledge on Zoom sessions and otherwise. So the second surprise was community. The kernel community is very direct in the reviews. So if you mess up, they say you mess up, but they also say how to improve and what's wrong with the patch. And this is very helpful when one someone is starting out and when I was a noob. And lastly, sir, my I was myself surprised because I really didn't think I could do it. I said in the I was talking about mess mess ups and setbacks, but I could finally do it and it was a very pleasant surprise. And so brain stalls and surprises. This is what is behind this arrow. And it was a fun learning experience. I got exposed to a lot of new things. So for anyone who is starting out, going from absolute no to sending multiple patches is very easy. One has to just start doing it. And if possible, go for LKM. So these are the sources I use throughout the presentation. So in summary, I went from being clueless to being confident with the Linux kernel. I started absolutely clueless and insecure. And I got exposed to new challenges and surprises as I had talked earlier. Uh, so LKMP is very useful in this part. And thus I got confident with my ability to tinker and I started making patches. And I then sent various patches during and after Linux kernel mentorship program, which got merged. So in DRM, Wi-Fi, X86, and there will be more to come, I ensure you. And I, for this amazing experience, I would again like to thank my mentor, Shua, Pavel, Linux Foundation, and the kernel community as a whole. So, and that, ladies and gentlemen, was what I wanted to share with you. Have a good day. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so I'll be here presenting as well my mentorship uh, experience. Um, in this case, it was in the context of, of the Hyperledger mentorship program. So just a few words about me. Uh, my name is Andre. I'm a PhD student in Lisbon, in Portugal. Um, so I have been researching blockchain interoperability for like a year and a half now. 
And it was in this context that um, I was, um, I applied to this mentorship in, in Hyperledger. So uh, the project was called Fabric Ethereum Token Bridging. So my mentors were Laszlo and Imre from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Um, so they basically had this um, prototype of a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. Um, and the idea of uh, like the, the problem we were trying to solve were, was basically um, uh, interoperating two different blockchains. In this case, we have a blockchain that has control over the CBDC that is managed by, let's say, central bank, financial institutions. Um, and it was powered by a hyperledger fabric network. And then uh, on the right, we have an EVM based ledger supported by, for example, hyperledger Bezu. And uh, in this one, we have retail businesses that expose their services to, to, to their clients, but their clients need to pay, of course, for the, these services that are being offered. So they need access to that core CBDC ledger um, on, on the left. So this was basically our, our goal to interoperate these different blockchains and uh, this cross-chain bridge in the middle that enables the interoperability uh, was exactly where we, we needed to work on. So uh, the main takeaways that uh, I take from, from this mentorship, first of all, you know, um, the open source communities are really interesting and you know, uh, we can provide help and receive help from from a lot of people, you know, uh, when we need just anything, we can just ask, and, and there's always someone uh, willing to help us. Um, we had some interesting meetings with a lot of people from from other projects that gave us interesting insights about our own. Um, then the power of planning, you know, uh, planning is very important, and I believe um, I underrated planning for a lot of a uh, lot of time in my life, but in this project was this project was a proof that if we plan, we can do it. We started in the first day and everything that we proposed ourselves to do, we, we accomplished. And then um, new technologies. Um, I learned a lot during this, this mentorship, uh, you know, a lot of new technologies. And this is exactly where I'm going right now. You know, we touched on uh, at least uh, three hyperledger um, uh, projects. We searched, researched a little bit other hyperledger projects or hyperledger labs, um, but mainly Fabric Cactus and and Bezu were the the, the main one. You know, I already already talked about Fabric and Bezu, but Hyperledger Cactus was in the middle. You know, it's the project in hyperledger um, that is focused on interoperability. And we touched in a lot of different technologies, um, a lot of different networks, including the IPFS, uh, the, the EVM, which is which powers Ethereum and, uh, and so on. So I need to talk, of course, about my, my mentoring experience. Uh, it was really, really interesting to work with uh, Laszlo and Imre. Uh, you know, we had daily meetings for three months uh, in the summer during the, 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 the mentorship. We also, met sometimes after that um and i just need to thank them for for the support the the, the guidance um you know and the, the the sharing of knowledge between between us so we basically uh, divided our our project in in different phases we had a, a planning phase we did some research on existing uh, cross chain solutions interoperability solutions um uh, design we designed our our own um, bridge implementation, uh, our own bridge. We implemented that bridge and uh, produced a, a a demo prototype to to showcase the work. Um, we produced some deliverables. They're accessible in in the, the mentorship page. I'll, I have a link here. Um, but if you go to the Hyperledger Mentorships program, you have there the, the the links as well. Um, you know, we have a, a little report on cross-chain solutions, interoperability solutions. Um, we have a design specification document. We specified, you know, uh, the tests that we wanted to to perform in our um, in our prototype, and uh, we implemented this proof of concept that is always uh, also available. Um, so yeah, there, these are the, the, the relevant resources. The, the first one, the Hyperledger Mentorship page, uh, you know, leads us a little bit into all of these ones. 
uh, you know, uh, the, the GitHub where we hosted our materials. Um, we opened the pull requests on, on Cactus. Um, the workshop, um, or Cacti in this case, we changed the name, Hyperlogic Cacti Workshop. You can also see that in, uh, on YouTube. Um, I have a presentation on, on this project, but a more in a more technical way, and then a academic paper that uh, yielded also from, from the work. So this was basically the final result, uh, you know, an interface, a web application that one can interact and see, you know, tokens bridging from one ledger to the other. Um, so it's, it's interesting and you can try this yourselves if you want. And uh, have Hyperledger Cactus uh, GitHub repository in, uh, in in this pull request. Um, you can check out that branch, take a look at um, at the at the code, and uh, if you have suggestions, if you have anything that you'd like to to say to contribute, whatever, just feel free to reach out, open an issue there, uh, contact us through the social media. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it. I have here also um, a QR code with a, the, the the demo. It's a video with the demo um, of our application running. So yeah, that's that's it. You have here my social media if you want to to reach out. Um, yeah, thank you for for having me. I'll pass the word to the next speaker. Okay. Hello everyone, I am Tiso Senosha. In the summer of 2022, I participated in the Open Mainframe Review Advice contribute to the Mainframe Open Education Project. So a brief overview of myself, I'm, I'm a student at the University of Johannesburg. I recently obtained my qualification for a diploma in Business Information Technology. I'm also an IBM Z Systems Ambassador and a Mainframe Open Education Project Student Lead. So for this project, I was curating content, reviewing and advising the core team on the changes that they could make. This project is a no-code open source project that is sponsored by the Open Mainframe Project. So what we're trying to do is to outsource the learning of mainframe skills to close the gap that is existing in the industry. I don't know if you know about this, but the seasoned professionals have reached their retirement age and we're trying to train new and uh, younger professionals to come in and replace them once they have retired. So we have a git book that we use to collaborate. Anybody can come in who's enthusiastic about mainframes to either consume the content or to share the knowledge that they already have. So what you do, you'd find on our Gitbook that we have foundational mainframe content that you can go through to be knowledgeable about the mainframes. We're not limited to that. We also have links that will lead you to more advanced courses that are on external websites and also we have links that will lead you to communities where you'll get support on your learning journey and also you can ask questions so from this project i upskilled my knowledge of mainframes like i've mentioned that I've, part, I've participated in the IBM Z Systems Ambassador Program. That's where I got to learn about mainframes. And then from reading the kit book that 
this project uses i got to learn more about mainframes because i had to go through all the content that's there on the git book and find out the gaps that are there on the platform find out what's missing that i could add so i went on to find more information from external websites and youtube channels to get that content and bring it to our git book another thing is that i learned to manage people i was tasked with establishing a student user group of which i did successfully i i collaborated with students from different universities across the globe uh, off the top of my head, I can remember the University of El Salvador, the Virginia Commonwealth University, and the University of North Texas. So I learned how to form a team of leaders that I managed. We meet every now and again to share a way forward draft a plan on how we can make the student user group more interesting. So I work closely with them and also manage them together with the students in the user group. I've also learned to communicate effectively. As I've mentioned that I had to review the content, the content that's there on our gatebook. So after I have read through that content, I make notes and from those notes, I go back to the mainframe open education project core team and share the findings that I've got. You know, I, I have to communicate with them on their level. It's not the same as communicating with students because uh, we understand differently. And I have to make sure that I come and communicate with them on their level. Same goes with the students. When I approach them, I have uh, a certain way of approaching them. My mentoring experience was really awesome. I worked with my mentor, Lauren Valenti. She's the director of mainframe education and customer engagement at Broadcom Software. So Lauren and I had bi-weekly meetings. So at the beginning of our mentorship, we met and established our goals. We wrote them down on a Google document and then bi-weekly we come back and review them, you know, to see how far I've come and what goals I've accomplished and which ones I still need to do. So Lauren would give me pointers on what I can do to achieve my goals effectively. So she, she was open-minded like that and would also teach me some of the communication skills that she uses so that I can effectively communicate my findings with the rest of the mainframe community. Sometimes we'd have um, personal conversations. She'd check up on me on how I'm doing. You know, if my schoolwork is okay and if the mentorship is not hindering me from accomplishing my university tasks. So I found that to be really helpful as it showed that she cared about me and would like me to do better. She also gave me career advice here and there. I was grateful for that. She made me realize that there are certain careers that are more suited for my personality and I'd be better off in those careers. She also gave me more opportunities. I was really surprised when she recruited me to be on their core team to work with them on a weekly basis because we have our meetings every Friday. And also she recruited me to be the university student lead. So that got me exposed to a lot more than was planned for my mentorship. So I'm really grateful for the opportunities that she gave me. So in the long term, I'd like to become a university professor and a researcher. So this was one way of studying my journey. 
I was just experimenting to see if I really belong in the education space. And I found that I like working in education. And like as a build up to my ultimate career, in the meantime, I'd like to use the technical skills that I've acquired and the soft, soft skills. You know, I'd appreciate to get into a role of being a mainframe system admin. I've started training on that. I've got my certifications from the Interskill Learning Platform. Uh, you can find more about that on my LinkedIn. I'll share the link with you in the ch chats. So I'd appreciate to work on that. And also as someone who's technically inclined and realizes how difficult it is for other developers to take on to write code, um, or let me rather say maintain the code that they have found. It's really a challenge if the documentation is poorly designed. So I'd like to help with that by being a technical writer um, to be the bridge between the old developers and the new developers. You know, it would be nice to still participate in the software development space and be less technically involved in that as I grow I and experiment with more careers in the field. Also, if there's a possibility, one other career that I'd like to get into is the software sales engineer role. So these are the three career roles that I'm considering now as, as someone who's a graduate. You know, I'd like to gain um, industry experience while I'm still pursuing my studies. So being a sales engineer would also allow me to work more with people and also use my technical knowledge to inform the customers about the products that I am offering them. With that said, I thank you for giving me your time. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Humphrey. Uh, sorry. Hey everyone, my name is Ryan Humphrey. Um, thanks to Linux Foundation for having me, uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my project dealt with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, more specifically, a miniaturized version of Hyperledger Fabric, a part of the Hyperledger Labs ecosystem, um, known as Minifabric. Before we get into what Minifabric is and um, what it's used for, I want to quickly introduce myself. Uh, again, I'm Ryan Humphrey. I graduated from the University of North Carolina in 2021. Uh, there, I was a part of a club Ultimate Frisbee team. Uh, it was a great team. Um, met a lot of good, like, lifelong friends. And one of those friends actually introduced me to this program. Um, Aside from that, uh, in my free time, I like to play a little bit of Texas Hold'em poker and over quarantine, I got into playing chess and I've been playing that for the past couple of years. Um, as far as career goals, uh, I'm an expiring full stack developer. I have this long-term dream of creating a startup, uh, but I feel like I need experience before I do that. Um, and I feel like full stack experience will allow me to fully carry out my ideas and be able to have knowledge across the entire uh, tech stack. Currently, I'm learning AWS. Uh, about a month ago, I got a cloud practitioner certification. And currently, I am transitioning my well, one of my projects from Heroku to AWS. So what is Minifabric? Uh, Minifabric is a tool to quickly up fabric networks. Um, much like what Minifabric suggests, uh, it's just a mini trials version of the Hyperledger Fabric uh, tool. Um, and it's nice because it can just quickly uh, and 
like very simply up a fabric network. Um, the tool supports both Docker and Kubernetes environments. Um, and it can run on personal machines. So instead of needing, or not needing, but you know, normally uh, a big network like this could run, you know, several uh, or separate servers across like different organizations. Uh, Going to be a big complicated uh, infrastructure. But the nice thing about Minifabric is it allows the developer to uh, work on their network all on a personal machine, and they can simulate nodes on. Uh, on different, across different organizations, all on their personal computer. Um, the tool is really good for beginners to get familiar with the ecosystem. Uh, Hyperledger Fabric is a big uh, daunting thing to get into. I had no prior experience with it when I started this project. Um, and so this tool is actually really helpful for me to also get familiar with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, with that being said, well, it is good for, for beginners. Um, it really just allows developers to focus on chain code instead of infrastructure. Um, developers can quickly just get a, a, a network up and running and start to write in chain code within about around 10 minutes, as, we, as you'll see here in, in a second. So what did I do on Minifabric? Um, I added Fabric operator support to Minifabric uh, and also built a deploy node operation. Uh, both of these, uh, combined to allow you to automatic, automatically deploy nodes um, to Kubernetes-based minifabric networks. Um, previously, we have to manually deploy these, and it took a lot of time. I also created a CI/CD pipeline to automate testing for incoming pull requests. Um, this is kind of self-explanatory, um, but basically, uh, for each new pull request that came to the repository, uh, Kubernetes cluster is built and um, it tests the code to make sure each operation that Minifabric runs will run properly on the, on the code. And I'm gonna go through a quick demo. Uh, before I start, uh, in the interest of keeping this short, uh, I set up the, a Kubernetes cluster already and I'll try to show like what I did previously. So see here, we had the Minifabric tool and all the different commands you have that comes with it. Um, I guess I should point out this is a command line tool. Um, so we have a Kubernetes cluster that's already running and you'll see the pods that are running on the cluster. You'll notice that we have an Nginx controller uh, as well as a metal load balancer. And those you will need to add in your cluster. Um, and then in your working directory, you'll need a vars directory and within vars, a kubeconfig and node specs. You'll need to copy over your kubeconfig file from your cluster into this, uh, into the kubeconfig directory. And then we can just start up the, uh, the network with this simple command. Um, this will take around two minutes. And you'll see here that within the virus directory now, um, the tool has created all of our certifications and stuff that come with upping fabric networks. So again, you see what we have in our cluster, but we don't have a fabric operator. And this is what I added over the course of the project. With this quick tool, deploy or minifab deploy operator, uh, within 20 seconds, you can have uh, an operator up and running on your cluster. And you'll see here you have a fabric operator running on our system. And now with the fabric operator running, it makes it very easy to deploy nodes. All you need to do is uh, put your YAML files from your nodes that you want to deploy into the bars node specs, and then run this minifab deploy nodes operation. And this will take a bit of time, uh, around four minutes for this one. Um, but yeah, and it gets it up and running. So you see here we have CA, order, and peer nodes all running on the network. You'll see at the top right, this recording took me around nine and a half minutes. Uh, I fast forwarded in some spaces, but basically you can get up and running from zero to a fabric network in around 10 minutes. And then from there, you can go off and running into writing your chain code. All right, so what I learned. Um, 
learning how to contribute to an open source project, uh, coming into the, the project, uh, contributing to open source seemed like this daunting, difficult experience, but it was the exact opposite. Um, once you like understand the basics, like it's not that difficult and it shouldn't have been so scared. And uh, I'm really glad, glad that I was a part of this project because it, it taught me how simple it is to get into it. On the complete other hand, um, I came in thinking that I understood how Git works. And uh, I learned that I don't understand how Git works. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's complicated and frustrating, but I had a great experience with it um, and I'm, I'm glad for it. Um, Kubernetes, Docker, and Ansible. I had no prior experience with any of these technologies, but I feel like I left with a good grasp of each, especially Ansible. And then patience and communication. Um, I got stuck a lot during my time with the project. Um, it was very frustrating at times, but it was a good time for me to practice communication um, with my mentor and just reach out and help. And, and he, would always, he was always nice to like, give me great advice and that leads me to giving thanks i have to shout out my mentor tong lee uh he's the man um i'm sure he got tired of all the emails i sent to him like asking questions um but it was always there to answer with intelligence and kindness um he really drove my experience with the project and made it such a worthwhile experience uh shout out min Yu. She, with the Linux Foundation, she was always there to like keep us updated, keep us mentees updated and, uh, and always answer my administrative questions really quickly. Uh, shout out Ry Jones. I never met him, never spoke to him, but he would um, merge my pull request within the hour, every time, just no matter what. I feel like he, I think he lived on GitHub. But yeah, and thank all you guys for uh, being here. Uh, and thanks for listening. Jose, can you please turn on your microphone? We cannot hear you. Jose, uh, can you try and select a different microphone? Bottom left, next to the microphone button. Bottom left, zoom button. You have uh, zoom buttons on the along the bottom of your screen. Yeah. Bottom left. There we go. Oh, okay. All right. right. Sorry Again. for the inconveniences. No problem. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, 
it's for me a pleasure to be here uh, presenting the Learning Tokens uh, project. Uh, this is a project uh, that was originally proposed by the Happy Ledger Latin America Re Regional chapter um, in, well, uh, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jose Marvin Enriquez Alfaro. I'm a web developer, a junior blockchain de developer. Um, uh, open source and blockchain enthusiast. Uh, I've been in this uh, industry for over a year and a half, and I have also contributed contributed as uh, a co organizer so co organizer of the CNCF uh, chapter of El Salvador. And well, about the learning tokens uh, project. Uh, this is uh, basically a mechanism to produce token definitions. Uh, for that, we decided to use the Composable Inner Work Alliance uh, taxonomy token, uh, tax token taxonomy framework, sorry. And so that way we could uh, produce definition, token definitions to accomplish this, uh, Base, these goals. Uh, the first one is to recognize and register the learning process. And the second, in, second one is to reward community engagement. And the third is to certify skills and competence, competencies acquisitions. And all of these um, uh, taking advantage of the unique properties of blockchain technology. As we know, uh, uh, blockchain offers uh, some unique properties as that it is, uh, we can set up uh, rules for its create, for the creation of the supply of tokens. And this is um, able to resist modifications and tampering. And most important uh, that is capable to, of being transferred peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So uh, the project goals uh, since the beginning were to understand the process of tokenization for collective learning. And well, for this, uh, we tend to think that tokens are just a piece of uh, digital piece. But for this project, we uh, believe that tokens can be a unit of value uh, to represent the process of learning uh, in, in communities and in, in, in educational institutions. So the second goal was to learn how to use the Network Alliance Token Taxonomy uh, Framework. Uh, this is an open source uh, uh, tool, the, the token taxonomy framework, and it was the, the, the main tool that we used to produce these token definitions. And well, uh, using the token taxonomy framework, we were, a we were able to produce the first uh, four definitions of learning tokens in that way to contribute new artifacts that uh, are platform agnostic and implementation neutral. So uh, the purpose of all of these is to, to create uh, or to empower a learning community of DLT, blockchain educational opportunities. And well, uh, some of the accomplishments in what I learned in this whole, in this whole process uh, were to understood and create uh, a business definition of targeted tokens. All of this is, is, is in the GitHub repo repository. And well, to, uh, I was able to get a good understanding and take a deep dive into uh, the Inner Work Alliance uh, tools, uh, specifically the token designer and the TTF, which is the token taxonomy framework. 
in well it was at first complicated because there was not uh, so much information about how to use it but it is an incredible tool that i believe could be uh, of help for uh, uh, well when it comes to design and create definitions of tokens and well that uh, helped me to create the first four definitions of learning tokens uh, in is this is this was helpful because uh, we could uh, establish some agreements with the educational institu institutions uh, to potentially use these definitions. Uh, at first, here in Salvador, with uh, the Yucca uh, University, and well, it, it, it was uh, complicated. Uh, but in this whole process, I had uh, my mentor. Uh, who is uh, Alfonso Govela. He is the founding member of Hyperledger, Latin America Regional Chapter, and he, he is a Linux Foundation mentor. And well, he helped me uh, quite a lot uh, to, well, provide, he provided me support and connections. We uh, had weekly meet, mentoring calls uh, to keep uh, uh, working and developing the project. And uh, he was in the process of um, uh, creating the, the, the token definitions as well and providing me with guidance with the whole uh, mentorship process, but not just that and, and more, he was, uh, so much help for me. And we set up goals for the future. This is not the end. Uh, this was just uh, the beginning of this project. Uh, I I know that the, the mentorship just was for six months, but we we uh, uh, well, talked and we're, uh, we'll keep uh, working on, on this project. So, well, I, I I'm really grateful with him. And uh, what about what's next and the aspirations I have? Uh, uh, one of the aspirations I have is to keep on contributing to open source projects. And well, as I said, I, I will keep working this uh, project of learning tokens for the implementation part. And uh, other aspiration I have is to learn much more about blockchain development and contribute in building solutions uh, for, well, using the hyperledger solutions, uh, for example. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, um, I'm about I'm attempting to share my screen at the moment. So let's see. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Francis Mendoza. Let me just start the timer here. And I will be presenting on Byzantine swaps. So Byzantine swaps is a rigorously secure method for cross-chain atomic acid exchange. Um, so in a nutshell, I am a new grad blockchain engineer currently working at Ripple Labs. Um, I do have prior past experiences at Intel, Fujitsu, um, and Certicay in terms of blockchain R&D experience all across, this chat, uh, all across the technology stack. In terms of academic experience, I bring five plus years of experience in R&D specializing in blockchain security and interoperability. I did two different labs, so the ASU Blockchain Research Lab and the ASU Cyber Physical Systems Lab. But that's just a little nutshell about me. 
in terms of Byzantine swaps, Byzantine swaps was the mentorship project that I had under four different researchers um, of the IBM uh, research division, as well as partnered with uh, Hyperledger, uh, the Hyperledger mentorship. So for context, um, Byzantine swaps are an alternative and deterministically secure um, asset exchange mechanism as sort of as an alternative to bridges. So for context, current interoperability solutions, they contain several fundamental security flaws. So um, in prior art, bridges are the go-to mechanism and bridges are very fast, but they are extremely centralized, meaning you know there's a central point of failure. If you're able to um, exploit the bridge and compromise it, you're able to basically um, cut off the flow of assets from one layer one to another, right? Um, and previously, it is impossible to roll back whatever the state of all the applicants using that bridge or other interoperability solution was to basically the last stable state. What this means more concretely is as long as you are acting within the parameters, uh, within the uh, de definition of the protocol, we were ab able to basically guarantee that you will not end up worse off than you were than when you entered sort of the agreement, the agreement being utilizing the bridge. Um, currently, there are no security uh, mechanisms or guarantees um, for that. Um, so what we want to provide is a guarantee that honest, uh, the honest party and counterparty are, are not able to lose any of their funds, provided there is no arbitrary violation of the protocol. So what that means is either in a semi-honest fashion or malicious fashion, um, in the absolute worst case, you will not basically lose any money. In the best case, you will get your money, um, your, basically your fungible um, asset of some kind as a token or a, a non-fungible as an NFT or a, a bond asset, for example, uh, basically transferred cleanly. So the contribution um, concretely is a decentralized um, alternative method um, for basically uh, cross-chain asset exchange that builds upon Maurice Hurley's original proposal for atomic cross-chain swaps uh, with these additional security guarantees uh, baked in. So basically, this is compatible with fungible and non-fungible assets to be able to be transferable. Um, this is all operating across the uh, Hyperledger Weaver framework. And our current implementation, we're basically demonstrating um, asset transfer between two disparate fabric networks. And there are several security features in place to not only uh, to protect a super honest majority, but more concretely, what that means is, again, nobody ends up worse off than um, when they enter the um, cross-chain agreement, um, and then in the best case, assets are able to um, transfer cleanly in a reasonable runtime. So this is a sample out output. So basically, we have a, um, a fungible asset swap between two fabric fabric networks. Well, really, should say non-fungible. So because we are talking about a bond asset here, so it's in terminal output. Alice is the locker, so she is locking an asset um, with relation to Bob. So the way that Byzantine swaps work is there is an explicit time limit that basically both the party and the counterparty have to complete the transaction. But if for whatever reason, uh, the reasons being if you violate the protocol, again, in a semi-honest or outright malicious fashion, or if you exceed the time limit in which you're able to transfer an asset, then um, basically we were able to roll back to a stable state where both the party and counterparty, provided you know they followed the protocol, protocol honestly are able to walk away with you know what they originally uh, were staking or set on the table so basically alice is locking um a bond asset in this case bond number one a03 on behalf of bob so then we query the network to basically uh confirm uh to weaver and also fabric that the asset has been locked um and as we do a status check um, the asset in question has disappeared. So you do not see uh, bond one asset, um, uh, bond one, A03 uh, within the network one because it has already been locked. So basically it's not available here. Then when we uh, query it again, also you will notice token values. Uh, this is a de demonstrative of the transfer for fungible assets, which are tokens. Uh, but uh, since we only have a 10 minute limit today, so we're only demonstrating non-fungible, um, you could see we were able to transfer basically from token one from the counterparty, uh, Bob, back to Alice, who now has 10,000 uh, tokens. Um, and then when we uh, do the check again for status, we had an arbitrary time limit uh, back here of technically 15 seconds. Um, this could be arbitrarily um, defined before. Um, and then over here, uh, when we query the state again, 15 seconds have elapsed. So technically, we are not able to query whether the asset has been locked in network one, because what happened was uh, Byzantine swaps rolled back the transaction. So Alice, who initially locked her asset on behalf of Bob, 
now has her asset um, returned to basically her ownership. So if we were to query the network again, basically we can confirm that yes, bond one of ID 03 has been returned to Alice's ownership, right? So that's Byzantine swaps in a nutshell because we only have uh, four minutes remaining. In terms of my mentors, um, I worked with four researchers from the IBM Research Division. So they were Venkatraman Ramakrishna, Dinakaran Vinagaya Murthy, Krishna Suri Nara, uh, Narayanam, and Sandeep Nishad. So in terms of uh, my mentorship experience, it was extremely positive. I grew the most in particular regarding cross-chain interoperability research and how it compares to prior solutions, as well as how we can make novel contributions atop uh, Maurice Hurley's original proposal for uh, atomic uh, cross-chain swaps, because previously they did not have the ability to basically not just guarantee that uh, we were able to roll back to a stable state, but to do it in a way that one, it's automatic, so no user input um, is able to basically intercept or disrupt that process. And two, uh, the creation of witnesses. So the reason why it is named Byzantine Swaps is that a network observers are passively observing the transaction, um, and we're basically able to confirm whether or not either a transaction has succeeded or failed, and we're able to also uh, basically record the state in the event of malicious lockup, because one of the key weaknesses of Hurley's design for atomic cross-chain swaps is that um, both the party and counterparty, if there is, if at least one of them is malicious, they can continue to basically um, reattempt an atomic swap. And what that does is that holds the asset in question in escrow. So other parties that may be interested are, are unable to receive said assets. So basically this can go on uh, forever in the worst case scenario where basically Alice and Bob hold, you know, this bond or this set of tokens forever uh, by just continuously repeating the transaction. But the protocol has um, no way to basically prevent that from happening. With Byzantine swaps, that attack is impossible. So the most impactful takeaway is to basically how to strike a proper balance between a theoretically sound protocol design versus industry implementation. Again, this is just a version 1.0 of our demo. Um, and I, and in the future, we will also have in a future talk, we will also have the demonstration of the fungible asset swap, um, not just across a fabric to fabric network, but also a fabric to Corda, um, as well as other platforms that Hyperledger Weaver is fundamentally compatible with. Um, so in terms of skills gained, definitely um, the intricate details regarding cross-chain swaps, what constitutes uh, sound protocol design, as well as threat modeling as what are all the various ways that we could break the protocol, either in a semi-honest or outright malicious fashion. In terms of software engineering skills, um, TypeScript um, was heavily utilized, as well as Go. Platforms included Hyperledger Weaver and all of its constituents, so it, namely for the purposes of this uh, mentorship, Hyperledger Fabric, and basically the agile process in a free and open source software setting. Um, so that's the end of my presentation, uh, and I have linked my email and my LinkedIn. Uh, thank you very much, and we will open it up to the next speaker. Yeah, so hi, my name is Kevin, and today I will be presenting about my experiences with the Lang Foundation Mentorship and the OpenHPC project. So a little bit about myself, I am currently a junior studying computer science at Brown University, and I'm interested in high performance computing, robotics, as well as just tinkering with things in general. And a quick overview of the project. Last summer for my mentorship, I got the chance to work with OpenHPC, and what OpenHPC is, is an open source project focusing on providing a reference collection of recipes for high-performance computing. So essentially what that means is it's a pack of tools, instructions, and provide support to build your own supercomputer. And the general goal is to broaden access to state-of-the-art tools, lower the barrier to entry, and promote best practices. So if you're interested, you can learn more about the project by going to the link here at um, openhpc.community. And during my mentorship, some topics I was able to dig into included setting up my own high performance computing cluster and getting to know the HPC ecosystem a little bit better. Additionally, through book recommendations by my mentor and workshops at a related conference, I got the chance to play around with parallel programming and run programming jobs on some of the supercomputers at National Labs, which was a pretty exciting experience for me. 
I was also able to learn more about concepts related to containerization through some hands-on experience with my project contributions. And I'm still applying those concepts today. So diving into details a little bit more, part of my mentorship was setting up a local cluster through virtualization and Vagrant. And with guidance from the community, I followed the OpenHPC recipe to install a small three node cluster with one login node and two compute nodes all running on my laptop. And through this, I was able to familiarize myself with some of the technologies and tech stacks in the world of HPC, as well as alternatives to them and what benefits or inconveniences each one brings. And during the mentorship, I was also able to learn much about hardware and benchmarking aspects of things. I created a custom script that measures training time on different TensorFlow models and ran it on different hardware architecture on an HPC cluster at my university. And um, a little bit more on that on the next slide, but some difficulties involved with that involved included um, differences in personal devices and the actual cluster. When um, in the former, I would have admin access, but not as much in the latter. And something else was running a script on bare metal versus through virtualization. So my project with OpenHPC also involved using NVIDIA's container maker to generate both Docker files and singularity definition files through Python scripts. Singularity is another container system that's widely used in HPC. And it was interesting learning about the differences as well as figuring out compatibility between singularity and Docker. So in the chart on the right, you can see the iterative process I went through as well as some of the issues encountered, such as permissions, accuracy, and versioning issues. And the end result of the project was a container image based on OpenHPC's tech stack with added support for NVIDIA's GPUs and the appropriate library versions to run the benchmark from the previous slide. And combining the two projects, I ran the benchmark scripts from the slide before in the container I created versus the officially released containers. It was pretty interesting to analyze and attempt to match the training time and accuracy of the two, finding ways to gradually improve my version over time. Um, in terms of my mentorship, I had weekly meetings with my mentor, Reese, and we would go over roadblocks with me laying out options I could think of and him breaking down the pros and cons of each approach, sometimes suggesting additional tools. And with Reese's guidance, I learned to take a more breadth-based approach to debugging instead of tunneling into the same attempt over and over again. For me, this method of getting feedback on my ideas, as well as discussing potential challenges of them, was an effective approach. And coming out of the mentorship, I feel like I am able to make more informed decisions in the future. The discussion-based methodology also helped me improve my skills in communicating difficulties I encountered and verbalizing my own thought process. It was also interesting to learn about the formation and development of an open source project from a mentor and receive guidance on industry practices. So I guess a few main takeaways I have, including getting to know how an open source community operates in terms of documentation, release cycles, and organizing funding. I also got to meet various people who applied their knowledge of HPC in all sorts of different ways, intersecting, intersecting with different fields while tying it back to high performance computing. And one more takeaway was experience some hurdles myself, and then seeing people present state of the art solutions at a conference that specifically addressed those issues and getting a better understanding of how research and pushing the boundaries of field works. Additionally, I've begun to incorporate more parallel programming into my project and being less intimidated by clusters has led me to consider larger scale and optimizations in my own work. So um, in terms of future steps in the future, I hope to be more involved in the open source community and contribute more to OpenHPC. I would also like to pursue the topic of parallel programming beyond my introduction to it throughout my mentorship. And on top of that, I would love to build a physical cluster out of Raspberry Pi with the OpenHPC recipe. 
I guess in general, I want to do more hobby projects related to HPC and think about ways to improve their workflow and existing tools. So um, here are the acknowledgements. I would like to thank my mentor Reese for all the encouragement, guidance, and excellent advice. I would also like to thank project lead Chris and the OpenHPC community. I was able to attend the supercomputing conference with them last November, and it was amazing to be able to meet everyone in person. And here's a picture of um, the customized Legos they handed out at the booth. So yeah, with that, if you want to chat, you can reach me at my email here. And if you're interested in seeing some more of my work, you can navigate to my website that's also listed here. So thank you for your time and thank you all for listening to our presentation. Thank you everybody. That's awesome presentations. And I am so happy to see all of you uh, learning about uh, the projects you took on and then also learning more about what you want to do in the future, uh, the career wise and um, figuring out what would make you happy uh, as uh, uh, and pursuing uh, fulfilling careers. So this is awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you all our mentors. Uh, without that, without them, we won't be do, able to do what we do. And thanks sponsors, Red Hat, GitHub and IBM and Intel. And thank you so much for all the presentations today.